Good afternoon. Welcome to RBC Disruptors. I'm John Stackhouse. It's my pleasure to host our ongoing conversation about disruption, innovation, and how technology is changing everything around us. If you're joining us on WebEx or Facebook Live around the world, welcome to the conversation. Please join in the conversation on Facebook Live and share your questions with us. To kick off the 2020 season here at RBC Disruptors, we're joined by two extraordinary Canadians who in many ways have already disrupted themselves. Uh, they've disrupted the way we make images, the way we see ourselves and our world. But in other ways, they're just getting going with something that they call Photography 3.0. Ed Bertinsky, you're probably all familiar with. Ed is perhaps Canada's greatest photographer, celebrated around the world. His images today are uh, on display in more than 60 galleries, major galleries around the world. His work is the subject of three major documentaries. You'll see some incredible images today, some of them you may not have seen before. Uh, we're joined by his business partner, Vikas Gupta, who is a pioneer in many ways in interactive uh, media and gaming here in Toronto. Uh, Vikas has worked with brands like Disney and EA, Electronic Arts, before joining forces with Ed, uh, and they'll tell us about what, uh, what they're up to and what they've, got, uh, what they've got planned. Ed, Vikas, welcome to RBC Disruptors. Great Thrilled to be to here. Have you here. Great to be here, John. Thank you. <laughs> We're also, uh, we're also joined by some members of uh, RBC's Emerging Artists uh, Program. And if you're not familiar with the uh, Emerging Artists Program, since uh, 2005, RBC has committed more than $80 million to organizations across the country to help emerging artists. And today we're proud that 13,000 artists across Canada are alumni of this extraordinary program. Obviously, it has a value to them and to their art, but it's really <coughs> important to us at RBC because part of our declared purpose is to help clients thrive and communities pr prosper. The second part of that statement, communities prosper, relies on artists in some ways. No community can prosper without culture, without art, and artists are really part of the soul of uh, all of our communities. So we're so uh, proud of our emerging artists and glad that some of them could join us here today. I've been wanting to have this conversation for ages because I can't think of a profession or a sector that's been disrupted more than photography. It's almost 200 years since 1826, since the world's first photograph, permanent image, was captured. And it's been well over half a century since the first digital image was captured. But we're really just starting to see some remarkable revolutions in how we create images of ourselves and of the world and how we share them. During this hour that we've got together, 100 million photographs will be taken around the world. Uh, you're more than welcome to add to that number, share it. Uh, <laughs> billions will be shared around, uh, around the world. But photography has always been about more than technology. It's really about social purpose. If you didn't catch the news today, 2019 has been officially declared the second warmest year on record. 2016 was a little bit warmer. And that confirms that the decade that we've just completed, the 2010s, is the warmest decade that we've ever recorded on this planet. Ed's photography has helped us understand what we're doing to the planet. He'll talk a bit more about that. And he's trying to use technology to help us see the planet in different ways, to share our experiences, but to converse with what, uh, what we're going through and what our planet is going through. So before we get into that conversation, Ed's gonna walk us through some of his own history with photography. Ed and Vikas, I wanna kick it off with, uh, with a simple question um, uh, about technology and photography and image making. Is technology today in 2020 making us better as photographers and consumers of photography? Uh, thanks, John. I do believe that um, the technology today has, uh, as an artist, made my job a lot easier. Um, back in the day when it was all analog um, and I would be framing a picture, it was all my professional training. I had to get the exposure right on the film, get it processed properly, and then get it printed. And that meant I had to figure out the real world to match the, what was capable on the other side, the print. Uh, today, with a digital image, I can take the picture and, as a printmaker, control the whole surface of the print. And I, I see myself as a printmaker, as an artist, because where I show my work is in museums, galleries, and people's homes and corporations. But, and that's where my work shows best. But at the same time, I can actually uh, control it in a better way. With that also comes the fact that 
it opens up the technology to everybody. So at one point, it, it took training uh, to be more exclusive, and you had to really understand the medium to really control it well. Today, if somebody bought a, my, the same camera I have today, which is a phase, and they put it on a tripod, and with auto exposure and auto focus, they can make in quality an image as good as I can make qualitatively, and, and, and make a print of that as well. Uh, that would not be that different. So today, as an artist, I think, and, uh, and it's always been that way, it's, it's the ideas you bring to the technology. So I do feel that, that, uh, that all the technology that I'm working with today opens up doors for me, but it also makes it more of a crowded space. And they're probably going to use a lot of the technology that Vikas has helped uh, develop. <laughs> Vikas, do you believe technology has improved photography as an art form? Oh, listen, without a doubt, uh, we, we've seen the evolution of technology and photography in so many different ways. You know, just uh, look at the latest iPhones, and I think, you know, your stats that you pointed out uh, earlier are, are phenomenal in the sense that now anybody can be an, a pseudo-professional photographer by virtue of the fact that you simply need to point and click, and then using technologies like AI and, and sophisticated digital technologies in the lenses, uh, you're taking high quality photography that really rivals many of the other professionals. I think the big delta, however, is Ed is a storyteller. That, that narrative, that sense of purpose, that is really what differentiates this kind of photography from somebody who you know, really whips up their iPhone and starts to snap pictures of a scene that, that doesn't really have any context beyond it. Mm. So we're going to talk a lot about photography 3.0, but to, uh, to lay the foundation, let's go through 1.0 and 2.0, Ed. Let's uh, look at some of your images. I wonder if you can tell us a bit about how you got started. Okay, so this image here, um, I'm working with an 8x10 camera. This is back in the early 90s. Um, I'm shooting with um, film that is 8x10 in size, so it's a massive lens. It would take me about half hour just to focus the camera. Uh, I'm waiting for the light. It's a very, very slow process. And in that, it really makes you think. And that even in the like late, late 80s, early 90s, one exposure on that between the cost of the film, the chemistry, and then getting a contact print would cost me at that time about $30. And I would do two sides of it. So to take one picture in 1989, I'm paying like $60, which, which is a phenomenal commitment to uh, an image. So I would spend so much time thinking about it. That's something that doesn't really happen today uh, very much with the digital because there's no real cost. It's just memory. So with that kind of slow photography, I went through and started developing themes. So for me, nature was really a, 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 an important, oops, I jumped out. Um, let me see if I can, um, yeah. okay, sorry. So I began photographing in nature and looking at the complexity of nature. And there was a real attenuation of, of my eye and mind and, and my position in the world to be able to kind of enter one of the most chaotic kind of environments, which is a walk in the forest. When you look at that kind of detail, it's very different than walking in the city. So in that chaos, I was looking for these kind of gems, these kind of like abstract expressions, like Pollock, like uh, all overness of the image. And I really trained my eye in that kind of space. And, and the f love of nature was also really important. And then at one of these trips, I actually came across a mining area. This is in Pennsylvania. And saw this landscape where the, the new birches were pushing through a coal area. And what, it, what I recognized in that picture was that seemed to be far more interesting <coughs> for me, for my time, than just looking at nature itself. So I then shifted my, my perspective to start looking at how we as humans at scale are transforming the landscape. So one of my first real projects was rail cuts going through the Rocky Mountains, like that, that ribbon of steel and what it means to nature, what it means to humanity, and how it trans transformed North America. That east to west rail brought all those resources back to the east converted them to our buildings that we now currently still have, to, to, to the uh, minerals and, and, and the pelts and all these things that came back through that rail. That was a key element. And then the, the actual settling of the West, that happened so rapidly once that happened. And I, I went and looked at the idea of homesteads and how we take over land and how that rail was also key to, to the development of, of the West. And then the other part of that big early 80s journey was mining. And I still photograph mining. It's been one of my biggest themes ever. Um, and it's that in what mining. What is it about mining that uh, 
cap cap captures your eye or catches your eye? Well, in mining, it, in one framing of an image, I can begin to show the scale of our taking that we've always taken from nature as a species. But what's changed today is through technology, the scale and speed of that taking has changed. And it's the internal combustion at the core of it, I think, that has also allowed that and, and the mechanical advantage of all the machinery that we put forward. So the technological revolution has allowed this to happen. And in a way, it's been an inversion of the sublime. In the past, the sublime was us diminished by nature. Like think of the Moby Dick story and the big whale and Ahab. Today, if you look at, at, at the sublime, it is we are dwarfed within the technological revolution. So now we have not only overpowered nature, but it also is bigger than any one of us can imagine. So the new sublime, I believe, is our technological evolution. And in many ways, this led to your work on manufactured landscapes. I wonder if we want to jump into yeah. So from there, that. I jumped into quarries, and then I did a whole series, again, how we extract at scale. This is a, 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 um, a kind of a jump of the imagination where I thought there must be places in the world that were removing material by the block, and it would have this residual architectural where is uh, that? feel to it. That's in, in Barry, Vermont, and then this is in Portugal. And this to me was like this notion of an inverted skyscraper looking down into the earth. And this is one of the very last images I took of quarries, and to me it was a very interesting exploration, starting with an idea, and then research, and then getting there. And then with that, I started uh, looking at, uh, for the manufactured landscapes, well, where has the Industrial Revolution gone? How, do, how, how come, where are the pictures showing how industry has moved from the West to China? And those images really weren't anywhere to be found. So I went first to look at the Three Gorges Dam, uh, the largest dam ever built by, by humans. Uh, the dam took 20 years of a continuous pour to make. Um, it's larger by over two times when they filled it. Uh, it actually had so much weight from the reservoir because it <coughs> filled in 15 days. It created a wobble on the planet. Um, and that was the first thing in China. And then as I went along in China, I thought, I, look, I looked at the coal industry. So China is one of the largest users of coal in the world. So I looked at the coal industry, the steel industry. I looked at the manufacturing industry. So this is a modern chicken packing plant in, in China. Uh, and then I looked at you know, shoe factory. This is a, a shoe factory of 250,000 workers. They were pulsing 20,000 workers at a time. They would feed 20,000 workers in one of these buildings in, uh, in 20 minutes, and there would be another 20,000 workers. So they would be able to feed 60,000 workers within an hour. Uh, and How did you get permission to, uh, to take those sorts of images? I actually never did get permission for this one. <laughs> <laughs> I snuck in. Uh, uh, <laughs> we tried for weeks, and when we got to the gate, they wouldn't let us. Then we knew uh, we had a contact. We went to another gate that didn't know us, and we said, uh, 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 we were going to see this guy. And they said, okay, great. And then we got in and I, and I snuck this. <laughs> um, and then looking at, uh, again, you, you know, the international Bauhaus side, this is Shanghai at the time, the fastest growing city in the world. Uh, when I got there, there was a million new citizens coming to Shanghai uh, on a yearly basis. Uh, five million new people had come. And this is, in a way, the Bauhaus international style. But when Gropius first came up with that idea, his, uh, he said that build these, build these skyscrapers, but there should be green space equal to the floor space of every floor beside the building so that people can get respite. They missed that second half. Um, so yeah, I think they offshored that. They offshored that. Um, so that was, again, part of the, the, the manufactured landscapes uh, project. And oil, again, being one of the re really key uh, drivers of everything, as I said back there, is that internal combustion engine and <coughs> oil. Mm -hmm. So that led into your oil project and some of your water work. I wonder if you can. So this is, I'll just quickly flip through a couple of the pictures from the oil project. Uh, so this one, I was thinking uh, back in the mid 90s, I was, I was driving and I was in my car and I had this epiphany that it was, it was going on, the, on my way to uh, Inco to photograph the tailings. It was a new black top and it was in my car and I just put a quart of oil in and I put some gas in and I, I had a plastic raincoat because it was raining and I was holding onto my steering wheel and it was plastic and I realized I was surrounded by oil but I didn't know, mm. like I didn't know where copper came from or nickel came from and I was going to show that but I thought where does oil come from? And I decided to pursue this idea of the sources of oil. I went to, uh, this is where oil was first discovered. Uh, the, the movie There Will Be Blood, uh, Cormac McCarthy's book. Um, that oil field's still alive and well. This is an image of it. Uh, I 
went, uh, looked at oil infrastructure and all the things that oil has allowed for the automobile. This is Los, uh, Los Angeles. And of course, Los Angeles, as many of you know, is the beginning of the sprawl, urban sprawl, but still exists as one of, and the super highways and the freeways. This is a four layer highway. I looked at infrastructure, drive through culture is another thing that I try to show in the oil project. Uh, also the end of oil, like the thing that we create, the single thing that we as humans create more than anything else is waste. Um, so this was a, a whole oil field left for dead um, in Baku outside. This was a, back when it was under Soviet rule, this drove the fuel for the, pretty much between the First and Second World War, this was the source of the best fuel for uh, the USSR at the time. Uh, now it was left for dead. I also looked at places where things go to die. The end, this is oil uh, drums that were compressed, they're called densified to take all the air out, and then being put back into the cycle to be turned into oil drums yet again. So this was a whole cube uh, of, uh, of compressed oil drums. Uh, looking at the end of tires, the opening picture I showed you, I was taking this picture at the time. Um, and again, looking at the largest tile pi tire pile ever uh, accumulated in the, in the world. It was uh, at its peak, 40 million tires. Uh, I Wait, took where is that? This is uh, outside of Modesto, California. Mm -hmm. And when I took this picture three months later, a lightning struck and it caught fire and it burned for two years. The flames were apparently 2,500 feet high. So it was the largest tire pile ever mm -hmm. to ever be, be on fire. And then I went to like Bangladesh to shipbreaking work where, where you know, ships go to die, the oil tanker. So this is uh, onshore, uh, the cut up oil tanker, the wall of the ins inside wall of an oil tanker. And this is a worker barefoot uh, working there uh, to by bare hand taking down these mm -hmm. largest vessels ever built by humans. Yeah, and all of that, maybe show some of your water images, but this leads into the Anthropocene project. Right, we'll so all of this, we'll you know, now that I kind of was able to get my mind around something, the scale of China and find themes and ways to visualize it, and then oil, it prepared me for something as ubiquitous as water. How do you begin to take on a project? And this is where I began to collaborate as well in the film. So Jennifer Basewald, Nick DePonsier, and myself, we did. Um, we uh, we co-directed the film on water, and then there was a whole series of uh, of images and and in the book. So here, I also moved to digital. So when I started the water project, I went completely digital. I'm shooting from high vantage points because when you look at water, what, what year is that when you shift to uh, that? Digital? When I went fully over it was about 2006 seven. So that was my. I, I did have certain projects I had went on the ground. I worked four by five, and then in the air I worked. Uh, uh, with digital, and then I went fully digital after that. So this is what I call photography 2.0, using a new tool, and it allowed me to work quickly, to shoot a lot of images, I was able to gyro stabilize it, I was able to do all the things I couldn't do, and get a better quality image than I could do with film, and that's why I went over, is, uh, is I had a digital lab much earlier, but uh, in 1992, but I didn't actually start shooting till 2007, because it worked better than film at that time. And these are some of the things I did in the water project. This was this oil and water mixing at the BP oil spill. And, and, mm. and this was actually the, the rig that drilled the <coughs> hole, which was uh, 23,000 feet that they lost control of. Um, <coughs> again, in the water project, this is another arch dam in China that I photographed, the largest arch, arch dam ever built. I looked at the uh, kind of one of the consequences of damming, this was uh, the Colorado River Delta with all the dams along the Colorado River. No water has hit the ocean from the Colorado River for 40 years. Um, again, that, here's the, what happens to the water of the Colorado, it's diverted. And on the right is what you see is, is, is what nature, nature uh, intended for the space. And on the left is some of the richest alfalfa fields in the world. Um, that was being exported to, to Japan for Kobe beef because that was the highest price for that of alpha. Uh, again, Colorado River water. This is again diverted water doing uh, a lot of the fr uh, fruits and vegetables for Europe in southern Spain. Um, the large scale agriculture. So our largest human use of water was agriculture and here we're, we're, we're depleting the Ogallala aquifer. Uh, these things are about a mile in diameter. So this image is three miles by one mile and this is producing mostly food for the animals that we eat, uh, all through the Texas Panhandle, and it goes through seven states, these pivot irrigations. Uh, this is a more sustainable farming, uh, dryland farming in, in, in uh, Spain. 
Again, looking at water different ways, this is the waterfront, the human need for waterfront. This is artificially created waterfront in, in a swamp area in Florida. So they do convert swamp land into, <laughs> into real estate in Florida. Um, and if you actually look at the picture, each one has a swimming pool, but around each swimming pool is netting because the amount of mosquitoes in this area is insane. So this is yeah. a mosquito breeding ground. Uh, and then, and then uh, again, the, 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 the kind of whole notion that, that when we cease and desist, uh, with water, when we let it be what it wants to be, it has this virtuous cleansing cycle. So it evaporates off the oceans, gets locked up into the mountains, melts down, and ends up in the water systems, you know, pure. So there's a purification system that naturally happens if we stop polluting. So, so nature is resilient in some ways. And with a water project, we, you know, we left it with this notion of hope that, that there, in, this, in this cycle, uh, and if we cease polluting it, it will repair itself. So I, I find it fascinating that over those 20, 30 years, you are documenting the human use of technology and what that is doing to the world uh, around us in, in positive and negative ways. Just quickly, how is technology changing your work? You reference going digital, oh, that's, that's one obvious move, but you're able to do things going into the 2010s uh, in the, the tail end of photography 2.0 that you couldn't have done in, in 1990. Well, f just one of the things, um, just curious, uh, AGO show, how many people manage our National Gallery show to see it? So the, yeah, that's great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, well, doing those big murals, for instance, uh, there's no way I, you could do that in an analog way. So I was able to then you know, uh, pick out the scale of my, the image that I wanted and then do a series of 200 images and stitch them all together using software. So that, and then be able to produce um, over 10 gig printing file. And so you're able to look at something at billboard size and walk right up to it and put your nose six inches away from it and you can see every detail uh, at that scale. So that, that was not possible in, in analog photography. And again, as I said earlier, the idea that, you know, as I take these images, I can control the contrast the color locally and globally uh, and go in there and, and work with, you know, removing some of the haze. Uh, like for instance, in China, when I was shooting that, I didn't have a digital camera, but I still shot film, but I had to take that negative film, scan it in and remove some of the, the, the haze by using contrast mm -hmm. control and then print it out again as a picture. So, so the technology uh, for me as an artist has been heaven sent. At, and, and it's allowed me to really hone my craft so that the prints I make today are by far closer to, to what I want than they were 20 years ago, for instance. Yeah, and it's just taking off. I mean, it's exciting what uh, Vikas is gonna share with us in terms of AR, but as we set uh, up that part of the conversation, Ed, I wonder if you can uh, take us through the Anthropocene project. Right, so I'll quickly run through. So the Anthropocene project, in my uh, career is the largest collaboration I've ever done. So uh, what's different about manufactured landscapes and, and the watermark <coughs> project with Jennifer and Nick is in this case, Jennifer uh, Bachewell and Nick de Ponce, in this case, um, we set out at the very beginning to choose all subject matter, to decide on the film, where we're going, why we're going there. And we're also following the work of the scientists who were defining Anthropocene and trying to ratify it as a new uh, epoch, planetary epoch, but this one driven by human activity. So, um, so we're using the scientists as our guides uh, to the subjects that we're going to, and, and in this last period, you know, it's a it's in terms of uh, his, you know, the history of the planet, uh, it, it, we're in like a second of, uh, of this period, but the transformation that's happening is the equivalent of, of what happened 65 million years ago when a meteor hit the planet and, and, and that cloud that came out of off that meteor impact off, the, off of the uh, Yucatan Peninsula um, removed 70, over 70% 70 of all life, including all the dinosaurs. So that was the last fifth great extinction. We are now entering the sixth, but we are the equivalent <coughs> as a, a single species to that meteor impact. And so we were interested in saying, taking the scientists kind of thinking and what the categories that they were looking at and what they're basically looking at is what are we doing today that a geologist a million years from now will be able to say aha i've just found this this is from the anthropocene this is when humans dominated the planet and and this is a place where we first started the whole project which is umaya 
And each one of those layers, uh, like that 10 inch thick layer, is 10,000 years. So each one of those layers is like all of hum uh, human civilization. So it makes, I always love this picture because it makes humans look like this soft, transient, fleshy species yes. uh, that we're just here for this kind of moment. We're, we're just visitors. We're planet. visitors, you know, um, because you're here you're looking at 60 million years of time mm. uh, from 40 million years ago to 100 million years ago. And, and geologists like going here because there's one layer and they say, aha, that's the iridium layer. That's when the meteor hit the planet. And this is where they all go mm. to look at that as evidence of that extinction event. Uh, so that's how we ended up there. But uh, cement, the number one techno fossil that we create. So what will exist millions of years from now um, is that if somebody's digging into this layer, they'll find a lot of cement. That's the number one thing that we do, followed by plastics um, and then alloys and aluminums. This is plastics. This is in Nairobi, one of the largest plastic dumps in, 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 in the in the world, um, and, uh, and, and it's interesting, Kenya just banned all plastic bags, so they've actually managed to really curtail uh, that. Uh, went to Germany looking at, again, energy, coal. The, the Germany shutting down all of their, uh, 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 half their nuclear power plants after Fukushima. What we find today is uh, that Germany is using more coal than they were before that, so it's pushed more energy over to coal. This is the largest <coughs> machine ever built by humans, the bagger in the background. Uh, and, uh, and it can remove uh, coal at an incredible rate. Um, this is looking at mining, large scale mining. This is a Chukikamata in the northern uh, Atacama Desert. Uh, this is mining in, 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 and again, using aerials. So a lot of my mining in the past was from the ground. Now I'm using uh, uh, helicopters. I'm able to really show and define what, how it is that we, we, we transform these landscapes at scale. How do we get the materials that we all use every day? This is a, a, a nickel silver mine. Uh, the tailings, uh, any mine, every mine has a tailings. So tailings ponds were part of the project. Uh, we're anthroturbation. So all the tunnels that we make is, um, is something that will go deep into the future. So they're all markings of humans. So we create massive tunnels. So this is a tunneling for fertilizer. So, so this is potash that converted to potash. And this is tunneling in, the, uh, in, in the <coughs> Siberia, in, in, in Russia. And then oil again. So I went to Niger Delta, looked at the, um, the oil business, in, in mm -hmm. which was one of the ter most terrible landscapes, the compromised landscapes I've ever seen, is what's happened to the Niger Delta and what's happened to the oil industry there. Uh, and deforestation. This is a, a northern um, a Borneo, and they're removing perfectly intact rainforest and converting them to palm plantations. Agriculture also being one of the largest um, you know, transformations of the human planet. So all those soils will be depleted. So in the future, they'd be able to say there's fertilizers, there's different things in the soils, and uh, the nutrients have been removed. So that is evidence going into the future. Uh, and the defore deforestation from both agriculture and for logs themselves and building uh, housing in, in Lagos. And extinction being one of the big events. So, so this is uh, the, the burning <coughs> of the tusks in, in Nairobi. Yeah, we're going to get into an incredible different way of seeing that, uh, right. seeing that sort of image. And this is showing just Lagos and, and what I was uh, telling you about the scale. So this is blown up to about uh, 12 feet high by 24 feet wide. Uh, this gives you a sense of the scale of the image. You can walk right up to it, see every car, almost license plate. And it's with this technology, I can lock a drone up, put a high resolution, 100 megapixel Hasselblad, and I'm going up there and I'm mapping and shooting that whole scene with the Hasselblad, bringing it back and stitching it in Toronto and being able to create a print at that scale, which is, again, impossible before digital. And impossible with my iPhone. Impossible. Well, <laughs> well you could do it, but it wouldn't no, be as good. It, it, wouldn't, <laughs> it, it, it wouldn't work. That's an incredible journey, Ed. Thank you for sharing uh, the, the, those images, but also the insights that, uh, that go with them. And a perfect setup to bring Vocas into the conversation and cast us forward in terms of where image making is going in the age of AR, augmented mm -hmm. reality. But Vikas, first give us some background on Avara, the company you and Ed have created. What's it about? What's it, uh, what's it trying to do? Yeah, I'm no, happy to do so. You know, as we've gone through the, the amazing images that Ed's provided, you know, the, the interesting thing is everyone here has had the benefit of hearing the narrative and all the background associated with those images. Um, 
what I find about Ed's work is that as you stare at these images, a narrative emerges, but it's very interpretive. So every individual decides, this is how I'm going to decide what this picture is all about. And, and so we, we love it. It's obviously a very important narrative around the impact that humankind is having on the planet. The challenge, however, is how do we extend that narrative to global audiences and extend it to them in a way that they can consume it in the manner in which audiences consume content today. And so the idea around co-founding of Art Together was really a, around taking technology, taking this art form, and then taking that narrative, embedding all that or integrating it together in such a way that we can now start to build these experiential connections with the state of the world in a meaningful way where people aren't just the problem anymore, but understand how they can become the solution. So really the, the objective that we have, first of all, our, our vision statement is building better worlds. And the, the idea is that we want to inform, impact, and influence people so they ultimately become change agents towards a healthier planet. The big question then became, well, how do you do that? So what we're now doing with Avara is we're taking these big, complex subject matters around climate crisis, around environmental issues, ecological issues, that most people can't really comprehend. We, we read, read the news, we hear about it, but the conversations I've had is, well, how can I, as one individual, do anything about it? And how do I understand what the consequence is uh, on, on a global scale? So we decided, let's take then bleeding edge technology, turn this into an experiential type of connection with that individual. Let's put them into the action and have them understand in a much more isolated way. And you know, we've got these four by four triggers. So as you're, uh, as you're leaving the auditorium afterwards, you know, please do grab one. You can experience this yourself. But the idea now is that we can take these big, big issues and literally in three dimensions, put them right into the palm of your hands so that you can understand them and then start to connect with them in a very fascinating way. The other, the other thing that we're trying to do is by, by immersing you into that experience, the idea now is that as we start to de uh, develop these digital habits or digital behavior, we really hope that that will transcend into physical behavior. So now that you've understood how much plastic and garbage is being dumped into the oceans, uh, which is, by the way, 1.5 million pounds per hour, equating to 40 billion pounds of plastic and garbage uh, annually. I mean, the most people don't realize that. Most people don't realize that all that plastic and garbage is now ending up on the shorelines uh, in the Arctic in various countries. We now, using augmented reality, can showcase that. We can actually put people uh, you know, into a position where you can tap, you can remove that garbage. You're now being digitally incentivized uh, through game theory and gamification to remove that. And then ultimately what we're hoping is that we can tie some of that incentivization uh, directly with the UN Sustainability Development Goals. So for, in our case, specifically around climate action, life on land, life below water. Now to answer your question more directly, the technologies that we're incorporating, everything we're building is based on proprietary IP. So we are inventing things that don't exist today. We're also leveraging AI technology to create that individualized connection directly between the user and that subject matter. And I'll show you some great demos around endangered animals, for, for example. We're also using blockchain technology to then protect high value digital assets. So within the experience, you can now acquire or adopt or, or buy digital assets of all types. Uh, some of these will include photogrammetry based imagery that Ed has produced and we will attribute a value to that. We will create scarcity around that as well. And then each of, each of those items now has a digital signature directly on the blockchain so that it's uniquely yours, and, and then it's transactable afterwards. We are modeling out endangered animals. So as an example, there are only about 450 Sumatran tigers left in the world. Now that number is appalling when we think about how fast that population has shrunk. Using an AI algorithm, because no two tigers have the same stripes, we would model out 450 unique, unique uh, Sumatran tigers, and now individuals can adopt or acquire whatever term we use, and then they reside as a digital signature on the blockchain. So we're incorporating a whole variety of very unique technologies, some that are mainstream commercial, in other cases we're developing quite a bit that is proprietary to us, but I think how we're combining those technologies is really the, the extraordinary experience that ultimately we can deliver back to the consumer. So before you give us a demo, you mentioned uh, photogrammetry. Explain briefly, if you will, what that means. Yeah, ph photogrammetry actually is, uh, it's, it's been for a long time. It's, it's making it an amazing emergence now, just given where technology is at. We'll show you some great examples of that, but you know, I'll, I'll use that as an example. Uh, three, three years ago, uh, a little over three years ago, the, the largest tusk burning ever in history <clears throat> took place in Kenya, Africa, where 105 tons of illegally confiscated ivory were burnt to the ground. 
Ed was the only photographer in the world who was permitted to go behind the lines and at the very last moment basically shoot the presidential tusk pile, which really is the combination of all the largest tusk piles that were confiscated. Within a matter of hours, he basically shot all the way around, basically taking five and a half thousand photographs. Those photographs then are all digitally stitched together uh, using a very unique process. It's a post-color processing and so on. And then what we do is we create a three-dimensional mesh. And ultimately, using sophisticated software, what we have ultimately is a full-blown three-dimensional model. But using photogrammetry, what that allows us to do is basically resemble exactly the, the real artifact. And so this was one of our amazing displays as part of the Anthropocene exhibition. But what makes photogrammetry so powerful, um, and, and for all of us, I mean, this was a powerful moment, is that as we watched people go through the AGO and other exhibitions and witness this amazing tusk pile at full scale, which no company or individuals have ever been able to do before, understanding the gravity of that moment, of what's occurred, um, that, that feeling, that, that visceral feeling of being there three and a half years ago, you can't replicate that in any other way. And, and there were people who were amazed by the technology, so we'd watch people sort of you know, going through every corner, getting close in, and examining every intricate detail. But then we would also people who were just awash with that emotion when they realized that 10,000 elephants were killed in order to create this. And we're, we're the only people and company in the world that actually has that in a 100% facsimile for, for a historic event that's now come and gone. Right. And give us a, uh, yeah. how it works. So you know, what, what we've got here is we, we, we've created an app that's a thin client. Um, we use, obviously, lots of technology that's up in the cloud and so on. And um, so I'll, I'll tap on this. Can we get that on the screen? There we go. Um, so what, one of the objectives that we have is to transport people to some of the most extraordinary places, moments, and interactions around the world. The beauty with augmented reality technology is that it is experiential. So the idea of immersion is a very critical part of all of this. Uh, my figure got on the way there. So here, what we have now is right in front of us, the planet emerges, we have the ability to spin this around. We can now select one of multiple AR experiences. So today, I'm gonna to take you from Toronto down to the Panthenol region in South America in order to come face to face with an endangered black panther. Now, as a fun fact, black panther is actually a term coined by Marvel. They don't really exist. They're leopards or jaguars with a condition that is uh, uh, basically, the, the opposite of being a, um, an albino, it's melanism. And now what we have is, is, a, uh, is a panther. This is fully interactable, so I can tap on him. Uh, the panther jumps into the water. We've got technology that automatically has the panther hitting the water, and then the birds fly away, as you would have noticed. Uh, you'll also see that every so often, this uh, plastic bottle comes by. Well, if you tap that plastic bottle, you can make it disappear from the stream because that plastic bottle does not belong in the Amazon rainforest region. And so the idea is that as people are now tapping that plastic bottle, and this is where game theory and gamification comes in, what we're now doing is we're, we're sending just a tiny little dopamine uh, injection into the brain because from a gaming perspective, this is that feel good. Uh, there, there's a great audio, you've got that visual component. And our hope is that as you're interacting in much more complex and much, uh, much richer experiences, the, the idea is that we start to, to really influence that behavior of let's now clean up plastic bottles, not just in a digital world, but in, in a real world. And we hope that if you see a plastic bottle on the, uh, on the streets, you're inclined to pick it up and then dispose of it. Uh, we've also got other neat technology where, you know, if I, if I move this away a little and then I, I get close, you see how the, uh, the Black Panther reacts. Um, so, you know, earlier, John, when you were asking about, you know, what are we building, what is the tech, we're trying to create uh, an experience for people that really does deliver that surprise and delight element. We want the technology to be buried underneath the hood, and what we really want for the end user is an incredible experience that just fascinates them, that, that they can immerse themselves into, and then at the same time understand, you know, these are the kinds of issues that the world is facing. I can take you now really quickly uh, from the Panthenol region uh, out to Indonesia, which is really the, the native habitat for, uh, for the Sumatran tiger. And again, you know, from an educational perspective, we've got interesting little tidbits of information that we display. So along the way, while people are being engaged, while they're being entertained, while they're having fun, we definitely want there to be some very important educational components that that end, end user can take away with them. 
And again, same thing here. I can I can tap on on this uh, this tiger. You know, uh, it'll interact in all sorts of uh, interesting ways. But in the same way as as before, you know, we we like to bury all sorts of really interesting uh, capability and technology. Where you know, if I do, uh, if he looks this way for a second, because he knows it's a demo and he's not going to cooperate. Uh, but you know, he, he will he will generally react when he realizes that we're getting a little too close for his comfort level. Um, and as we continue our development, the idea is to make these much richer experiences. The direction that we're headed to is ultimately what we call world building and collectibles, which is a combination of two very popular genres in the games industry. What we really want to deliver to the global audience is, is this idea of building these amazing rich ecosystems where now that user is, is put in charge of creating ecosystems that become the natural habitat for animals so that they don't go extinct, uh, and recognizing and understanding what those elements are so that we then bring those elements back into our everyday lives. What's the, uh, what's the business model? How do you ensure that you can uh, not only continue to invest in this, but scale it? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So, you know, from a scale perspective, I mean, it's one of the reasons why we've taken the approach that we have. Uh, we, we believe that by delivering an engaging, entertaining, but a crucially important experience, it really does start to pull people in. And it's one of the reasons why we're not trying to be documentarians here. The, the idea around this is to uh, inject enough game theory and gamification that there's mass, mass appeal. So the scalability comes from that stickiness of, you, you go into this experience, you now need to feed your tiger, you need to nurture it, you need to take care of it. And, and if you're not, every so often what's happening is that you're getting alerts on your device letting you know that, by the way, you haven't um, you know, taken care of your environment properly or your particular endangered animal uh, needs food, needs nurturing, etc. That's where you get the stickiness, that's how people continue to come back. As we continue to build, as we continue to evolve, the monetization model is around in-app purchases where through microtransactions uh, built on a fairly comprehensive and robust economy, the idea being that you would acquire or purchase this item or that item in order to be able to create that ultimate and ideal ecosystem. And then going back to photo photogrammetry, this is where some of the blockchain components become very interesting because you know, Ed's gone out to, to Africa multiple times. He's brought, brought back some amazing, amazing artifacts from Madagascar, these beautiful trees that only exist in that region that are 1,000 years old. Using photogrammetry, we can now turn those into high-value digital assets. So you might acquire something for, let's call it 25 cents here, but an Ed Bertinsky, in this case, might be five or $10. We might limit that to only 10,000 or 20,000. And now you've got that high-value digital asset that the end user has the ability to buy. So it really allows that Bertinsky brand, as well as other photographers that we will work with, to be able to get out there into the mainstream audiences it allows us to take that narrative that Ed's pursued for the last 40 years of his career and extend that in an experiential and an immersive way to the mainstream audience who otherwise may not have that opportunity to, to see Ed's photography. I think you've got the Tusk, uh, the Tusk display as well with you. I do. You can look at that. And this is, uh, you know, th this is actually a phenomenal one because again, five and a half thousand photographs were, were taken in order to be able to create this. And so right there, uh, you can see just that level of detail. If I, if I get in a little closer, what you can see now is, is the, in the individual grains. Uh, when these were confiscated, every one of the tusks was serialized. So you can just almost read out the, the individual numbers. They're all weighted. Um, but that level of detail simply isn't possible using 3D modeling. And so everything I showed you previously was around 3D modeling. We've got an amazing team that designs this. This is five and a half thousand photographs transform now into this incredible, incredible three-dimensional image, which is digital, but this is a one-to-one -one with exactly the real presidential tusk pile that Ed saw in person three and a half years ago. That's my, and Ed, you were just walking by? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> happened to bump into it, yeah. and uh, yeah. So they do, but uh, seriously, they, they turned to you to document this. Well, what, no, I, I, what was I, the conversation? It was, actually, it was a lot of work to get it, and we didn't think we were actually going to get access to it. It was very challenging. There was a lot of security around it. Um, we got there at the very beginning, and, and those who have seen the, uh, uh, the Anthropocene, the Human Epoch, the film, will see the, the opening of the film really starts with the building of these, uh, of these tusk, tusk piles. Um, so it was a lot of negotiation to get there, and uh, we had to get the okay from uh, President Kenyatta himself 
to, to get access to the pile. In fact, that was considered, it was called the, the Kenyatta's pile, president, the president's pile, because it had the uh, tusks of what's called super tuskers, those who have you know, tusks that are over eight feet that were often, you know, the male bull elephant will kind of skid the tusks along. And of course, if poachers come, and they look at the herd, they're going to go for the biggest tusks. So they, uh, there's only 25 of them last, left, and there were more than uh, 25 sets of uh, super tusker uh, tusks in that. So for me, it was one of my first real foyers. I've been looking at doing uh, 3D, and it had this interest in 3D, and I recognized when I saw and learned about photogrammetry that the same tools that I used to take my two-dimensional pictures can now be employed in doing, uh, as the cost, and it was a little less than 5,000, but, but a lot, like, around 3,000 images, and we would take the 3,000 images, and then you put it in software, and, and five days later, it'll stitch it all together, and then you'll find out there's a whole bunch of images that don't know where to go, and then it takes hand work to put them in place. And then next thing you know, you have a three-dimensional image. So to me, it was um, like a, an absolutely new form of photography uh, that has, again, been born by digital, and this is no way you can do this in an analog world. And, and that really excited me, because it would be like, for me, it was like, as an artist, I was thinking, well, it would be like everybody was taking black and white pictures in the 30s, and all of a sudden somebody came along and said, hey, you can put this roll of film in your camera, and you can make color pictures of the world. To me, it's almost like a jump of that magnitude. Now you can use the same tool and bring our three-dimensional world in which you can walk around it. And as I believe technology gets better and the form factor for VR, because all these things can fit into VR as well, or if we have augmented reality glasses where it's projecting onto a retina and then you'll be able to put on a set of glasses and have uh, the image projected right directly on your retina so that there isn't a frame or a phone that you're experiencing with but actual a set of glasses uh, that you can then experience it with. I mean, it almost takes us into the holodeck. It almost I don't know if anyone remembers that from Star Trek, but the holodeck where you're kind of you're part of the uh, the image. Precisely, and the, with the glasses, that becomes a reality. That you're all of a sudden you don't have any frame around it, and you know you can have something play out right here on the table. Where, where's that going to take your photography? Well, I think it keeps moving it more and more. Where there's a blend, where where the where you know being involved in film. I'm finding, number one, as, a, as individual things, it's almost like going back to, uh, you know, Robert Rauschenberg and Marcel Duchamp as the ready-made. I can go out into the world and capture an object that, that would be too big or too hard to, to bring in to a space, but have it, you know, as, a, as almost a sculptural piece. So I can go in there and start, and I've been doing a lot of that, and the, the big mining equipment, the big tires, and things that I want people to be able to experience. But um, the other ways in which I think it's really interesting is that there are, are narrative and interactive aspects of it, which working with Vikas that, that are interesting. And it isn't my artwork per se, but it is the thinking about this technology and how you know, everybody has the ability right now with the phone to engage with it. So it takes it out of that kind of museum or, or, or that precious world and it ends up in a more of a ubiquitous, uh, anybody can experience it world. And, and one of the interesting things in working with Vikas is that he's, you know, he's worked in the world of gaming and scalability and bringing messages out there. So as a kind of an adjunct to what I do as, a, as an artist, it's, it's really amazing to work with someone like Vikas to say, how can we use some of these new emerging tools and technologies to engage with the millennials who get all their information from their phone now, from last time I checked, or most of it, um, and, uh, and get into their world uh, where they're going to be digesting information. So th this idea of uh, scaling brings us back to social purpose. And I want to, in our remaining minutes, uh, get some thoughts and share uh, your experiences with a re another remarkable uh, project. Last year, the Royal Canadian Geographic Society, which you may know through Canadian Geographic, partnered with Ed and uh, the art artists of the Anthropocene Project to expand its reach, especially among uh, youth, uh, in getting into the classrooms from coast to coast to coast. Uh, the RBC Foundation uh, is very proud to be able to support this and has committed $525,000 over three years to helping get this amazing technology and the art that it helps to uh, transmit into uh, classrooms and to help shape future generations. We've got a video, short video here uh, to give you a sense of, uh, of uh, 
these ideas at work, if we could play that, please, and then we'll get some thoughts on what that's going to do with Ed's work. By providing classrooms with immersive learning tools that incorporate film, photography, and augmented and virtual reality, this program is an opportunity to experience the history and science of the Anthropocene <coughs> while learning about the impacts of everyday human activities on the Earth's natural systems. Through virtual reality, students will travel to the marble quarries in Carrera, Italy, witness the historic ivory burn in Nairobi, Kenya, explore the expansive Dandora landfill, and observe the life cycle and impact of plastics right here in Canada. Ah, there's a machine right in front of me. That's fantastic. And, and why did you want to be, uh, why did you want to attach yourself to Canadian Ge or the Royal Canadian Geographic Society on this project? What does it mean to your art? Uh, first, I want to mention that uh, Jennifer Basewall and Nick DePonsi were very much leads on the educational side, but the Royal Canadian Geographic Society, we became, we wanted to do the same thing with Watermark, but the, the conditions didn't happen where we can take a lot of the material that we developed for for that film and for the exhibition and deploy it to in, into the school system and and have them kind of with much more rich uh, visuals and ideas to work with uh, to engage the students with thinking about uh, the planetary issues that we face for our time. RCGS actually had access to through their uh, web portal to 23,000 uh, teachers across the country who teach geography and teach about you know uh, climate change, and and that seemed to be the perfect place to work with. In that they um, one of the more difficult challenges of, of getting material into classroom is curriculum and getting it through normal mm -hmm. you know channels of curriculum. But if you can have a place where for no charge at all. Um, you know, the, the teacher can go and digitally download the, 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 the lesson plans and the images and the film, the film snips and all of that from these different ideas that we felt that that was a great way to extend our work as artists into the school system and have it continue. And, uh, you know, with the funds from uh, uh, the Royal Bank and, and we also ha had other f funding models, uh, the, the Ministry of the Environment and TELUS were also helpful in, in bringing funding to this project. And now we have these kits uh, that are going around to the schools that have a, a lot of AR capability to the kits. So they have headsets, they have iPads, they can engage with the material. And, uh, and there's lesson plans. Uh, there's about uh, 14 different lesson plans that teachers can, can access. So uh, that really is gratifying as, uh, as artists that it lives on because we've now, I mean, uh, Jen and Nick are now just finishing up on all the assets and they're going to be moving on. And I've already been doing other work in Africa. So, so we're, we're moving on as artists, but we, it's, it's great to know that this lives on in that kind of a forum and, it, and it's helping shape uh, the young minds of, uh, of today for the problems of tomorrow. Now, it's so uh, in, in inspiring to see technology and art at, at play with geography. I instantly want to go redo grade 10 geography when I see that, uh, <laughs> that video. Lucky, uh, lu lucky kids. Um, we've got just a couple of minutes left, uh, Ed, because I, Ed, this is an incredible conversation and could go on and on. I wonder if you can just give us uh, some quick insights into what's the next big thing for, uh, for you. What are you going to take on? Well, I mean, Anthropocene by far is the largest project, and there's no way I could have done it single-handedly. So collaboration was was something uh, uh, that was at this scale, which was a new experience for me, and it was very rewarding because there's no way any of any of us individually could have pulled yeah. what we just did in the Anthropocene off. The, the fact that between the Archive of Ontario National Gallery and and now at Bologna. Uh, in each one of those locations, we had over uh, 100,000 visitors. Uh, AGO had 150, and Bologna just gave us our numbers, and there was 150,000. And that's really rewarding that a lot of people and students are going to see the show and engaging with that, which for me, it's really rewarding. In photography, we're all, we're inundated with images, but to make images and video and that we get, you know, we, we take in every day of our lives, but to get people out of their chair and come to a museum to see it, it means I think there's something going on. It's working. People want to engage, and, and it's uh, I think it's a really uh, rewarding thing uh, that that we're looking at. The film uh, has been doing great. I mean, even in Bologna, we just heard the numbers for people who saw the film, and it was like 57,000 people went wow. to see the film. And uh, so, 
it, I think it's <coughs> currently uh, it's on uh, the top doc on iTunes in the, in the States. So it's great to see that it's getting in and people are seeing it. And I think the time, the time is now. I mean, we're all seeing, I think, the issues. And, and so the big, the big things I'm getting into is, again, trying to continue to expand the ideas and themes and visualization of the problems that we've had through different forms and using you know, uh, uh, you know, partnerships with, with, with the cost and taking it to different worlds uh, with Jen and Nick, their film expertise and taking it into those worlds. And, and then the whole new thing that we're doing with augmented and virtual reality. I think those are all exciting ways to do it. And I'm currently, personally as, as an artist, moving uh, and been shooting in Africa now for over three years and taking the China project that I showed you from years ago. So I got there in 2000 and shot from 2000 to 2005. Now um, China has expressed you know, that they want to offshore 75 million manufacturing jobs. So I'm actually following- 75 million. 75 million over the next 10 years. So I'm, I'm and, then, and a lot of the jobs are the ones that, the two reasons, one, uh, the labor in China has gotten too expensive, so they need to find cheaper labor. So they're going to Africa and Asia, Vietnam, Bangladesh. And secondly, environmentally, they're choking. They're, 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 the problems they're having with their water systems, the choking of the air, the energy it needs to run manufacturing, they're trying to offshore it for, for all of those reasons. Um, so it's really interesting to see how globalism and how that movement is now, you know, went from the West to China, now China into uh, and being spread out, so I'm I'm very interested in looking at and after after Africa, there really isn't anywhere else to go. Antarctica, space, space. Mars. <laughs> you you and Elon Musk can go uh, document Mars, but we can yeah. we can expect a big yeah. Africa project from you yep. in the next few years. Because well, I, what uh, I, I just to add to that, you know, I, I, listen, I, I often say about the subject matter of what we're working with is that the good news and the bad news is that there's no shortage of content and subject matter. Unfortunately, you know, there are so many issues facing our planet today that we we could be developing all sorts of really interesting things for a long while. You know, from, from a, a mission perspective with Avara, I mean, really for us, we're an early stage company. The idea is to, to continue to scale, to grow, but most importantly, as we're doing all this, to really release and deliver these compelling, rich experiences that, that meaningfully connect people with the issues that we're dealing with. And then again, hopefully influencing that behavior towards changing agents, change agents uh, towards a better planet. Uh, it's a big, big mission. And, and there's a lot of work ahead for us, but you know, it's what makes it exciting. And, and I think you know, it's an industrious ambition mission that you know, more companies and more people need to focus on, you know, given the state of where humanity is today. Incredible, incredible conversation. I'm sad only that we uh, have run out of time. I want to thank our audience. If you've enjoyed this conversation and want to hear more, sign up for our podcast, uh, RBC Disruptors. You can find it on all your favorite podcast uh, platforms, on Spotify, on Apple and Google Podcasts, on SoundCloud. Uh, sign up for our email list as well uh, through RBC Disruptors, and you'll get notifications of uh, upcoming events. We've got a great calendar uh, coming at you for uh, 2020. And please join me in thanking Ed and Vikas for spending time with us here at RBC. And uh, Vikas, Ed, thank you. Uh, th thanks for the conversation, but uh, uh, thank you for the incredible work that you're doing, pioneering work both in technology and art. So it's just great to, uh, sh for, for you to share a lot of that with us. I wonder if as people thanks, are Rob. heading out, we might even play the Anthropocene trailer. You can stay and watch a bit of it if you have to get on with your afternoon. We understand, but uh, Vikas and Ed, again, thank you from RBC. John, thank, thank you. Thank you. The Anthropocene is the time in the geological record when humans have moved the planet outside its natural limits. Humans go from being participants in the whole Earth to being a dominant feature. Dominating the oceans, the landscape, agriculture, animals. It could be a full-scale catastrophic change.
we have not a way to get back. We live now in a different world. It is such a fundamental change in the way the Earth is behaving that we need to communicate that as powerfully as possible to everybody.